Greetings and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or you've been sitting in the back row and you enjoy what you are hearing, please consider subscribing and setting your notification bell to all. That way you know every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Ouija Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. My mother gets interested in card reading and spiritism just before she has a nervous breakdown with schizophrenia symptoms. One day I was walking through our kitchen to get something or go to the bathroom. She was with her friends doing a Ouija board with a glass and letters on cardboard. They asked me to join the game. When I put my finger on the glass, it switched across the table then, smashed on the wall. I was only 10 years old. My life was already a misery with two narcissistic parents with a brain age of at least a teenager. Nothing good came after that experience. My teen years were very, very dark and sad, and sometimes I feel something looking at me from the darkest corner of my room if I stay up way too late at night. I have seen things in a place where I used to live. I was questioning my mental health because I cannot explain what I have seen. If you want to know, Ouija boards will let you know for good, but be prepared to see things in a very different way. Hello to you all. I thought I'd share something interesting that happened to me about 15 years ago. Most won't believe me for what it's worth. I promise everything I tell you is 100% true and how it happened to the best of my memory. However, names have been changed. I was 18 years old and I was hanging out at my friend Joanne's house with some other school friends. Can't quite remember how we got onto the subject, but Towards the end of the evening, Joanne thought it would be fun to perform a seance. Joanne and her family were from Cape Town, South Africa, had a deep-rooted interest in the spiritual, or at least that's what Joanne made out to us. With the lights off and candles lit, we all sat around a round table with cards fanned out around the edge. Each card had a letter of the alphabet, a range A through Z, and a shot glass placed in the middle. Joanne starts speaking out to the spirits in Afrikaans. I remember pulling a face and rolling my eyes. It was too dark for anyone to even take offense. At the time, I was an insufferable, enlightened atheist, teen dork. You know the type. Cringy, 4chan, edgelord who thinks any form of spirituality or religion is beneath me and all of my superior intellect. I never wore a fedora, but I was damn close. However, what was about to happen made me question everything. It started mundane enough. A few questions were asked and the shot glass we were resting our fingers on started to move to and fro until eventually one of my friends asked the spirit if they were associated with anyone in the room. The shot glass moved directly towards me incredulous, I ask, the spirit, if you're associated with me, then what's my mother's maiden name? My eyes fixate on the letters that spell out her maiden name, which is Jones, and the glass started spelling out something different. First the glass went to T, then H, then O. I thought then it was bullshit as it was completely wrong. Then I was struck by a horrific realization. When my mom was six months old, her biological father died of a heart attack, and a year after that, she took her stepfather's name. I completely forgot this in the moment as I was expecting the glass to reach out in the maiden name she had for the majority of her life, but 
It was actually spelling out her original maiden name of Thompson. It was a fact so trivial that I barely remembered it myself. It was something never talked about even with my family as it happened so long ago. It would be hard to believe that any of my friends would know this esoteric piece of my family's history that occurred 20 years before I was even born. But nonetheless, somehow, it was beginning to spell it all out in front of my very eyes. Thompson. My school friends and I wouldn't talk about anything deeper than video games and tits at that age, yet there's no way I ever mention this to any of them. It's not like one of my pot-smoking loser friends had a copy of my mom's birth certificate, and none of them ever met anyone else in my family. There was literally no way anyone could have known this information. Before I could contemplate this for too long or ask any questions to my ghostly associate, Joanne's mom came into the room and turns the light on and with a thick S.A. accent, shouts something like, Bloody hell, Joanne, stop messing with this silly crap, and then put a definitive stop to the proceedings. Of course, at the time, I played off as a prank, but the more I think of it, the more my mind wonders, did something actually paranormal happen that night? I know it's nothing dramatic or exciting. I didn't see any apparition or cryptid, but unlike 90% of the shit you read on, you know, Reddit, take for instance, this experience is actually true, and something to this day I can't explain. I would love to hear your thoughts. I know people will hear my story and probably think either I'm full of shit or just flat out crazy. I'm going to tell it anyway because I think people should be aware of the danger they are putting themselves in playing what they believe is a game. It's not a game for all people at all times. I don't know if some people just draw negative entities to them or if it has more to do with the location they are using it in when negative entities show up. Children are more often to those type of things and haven't yet developed the skills to block out those things quite yet. I'm not like most parents. When my child told me they were scared of the dark, I always took them seriously. I never told them monsters weren't real, and I never told them that it's just their imagination, because I know that sometimes it's not. Some people are more open to things that most others aren't. That's the real problem with this. Unfortunately, most people just can't grasp that things they can't explain can possibly be real. They tell themselves that there's a rational explanation when sometimes there just isn't. Now, on to the story. When I was 10 or 11 years old, I had a neighbor who lived up the street who had a Ouija board. Our friend group all were extremely interested in it once she told us about it. The four of us walked to her house and retrieved it. We brought it back to my house and took it to my basement, where my bedroom was. My bedroom was always dark and damp. It was borderline scary on a good day without a Ouija board and four curious kids. We sat on the floor and all placed our hands on the planchette. We started asking questions, and within a few minutes, the planchette started moving. We all started accusing each other of being the one who moved it. To prove that we weren't the culprit, we all started just barely touching the planchette, barely making contact with it to prove to each other that we weren't the one who was moving it back and forth. Here's where I believe we went so wrong. We started asking dumb questions like, who was Jack the Ripper? Can Jack the Ripper come through and give us your name? Yeah, I know that was dumb, but we were children, and we believed that we could solve the mystery with a little help from the other side. We didn't stop to consider that what we were asking was very dark, and we were inviting dark forces by asking dark questions, all while sitting in a dark and somewhat scary room. 
We also didn't know the rules about always making sure to say goodbye and have whatever you've made contact with say goodbye as well. Basically, we opened a door we didn't know we opened and we left it open because we didn't know any better. Nothing happened right away, but we did continue to play the Ouija in my house every single day for weeks, trying to get the answer and solve the mystery of the true identity of Jack the Ripper. The weirdest thing that happened while using the board was just the planchette moving, even though we were all touching it so lightly we were hardly touching it at all. Of course, we all believed that one of us was moving it, and we all kept blaming each other, and we all vehemently denied it was us because it wasn't. Nothing really weird happened until after everyone went home, and really didn't start until we had used it for at least a week. The reason we picked my house in the first place is because I already knew something was there. As a small child, I used to see apparitions walking between the rooms and the downstairs. They were harmless, but the one that showed up after using Ouija wasn't. I know that's hard for a lot of people to believe, but I'm not going to let that stop me from telling my story, because it may actually help someone else make a better decision for them or their children. I'm understanding of being skeptical of things that you haven't personally experienced. I'm understanding of the fact that most people aren't susceptible to those sort of things, and most people will never have a clue that they're ever even there at all. I'm not here to convince anyone of anything because I already know most people just can't grasp what I'm saying, and that's fine with me. It didn't take long before I started seeing a giant three-dimensional shadow shaped mostly like a human in my room at night. It would watch me from the corner of my room. Sometimes I would see it walking past my bedroom door. I always left it open at night because I was down there all by myself. My mother and my grandmother were both upstairs. When you went downstairs at the bottom of the stairs, there was a bar with a sink and a refrigerator. To the right was a large family room. To the left was a door that took you to the laundry room and utility room. And there was also a bathroom in there. That was the darkest place in the house because there were no windows at all back there. It was the true basement. The house was a story and a half. It was built on a hill so from the front it looked like a one-story home. And from the back it was two stories. If you went right at the bottom of the stairs and walked through the family room, there were two bedrooms behind the family room. You had to walk through the first bedroom to get to my bedroom, which was behind it. One used to be mine and the other was my brother's, but he moved in with our dad, so I sort of took over both rooms, but my bed was in the one in the very back. One night, I was in the family room playing with army men and listening to Guns N' Roses on my cassette player. The door to the laundry or utility room was open, and the lights were off in there. I had been telling my mom and grandmother for weeks that something was down there, and I wanted to move to the extra bedroom upstairs, but it was used for storage, so it would have to be cleaned out. They didn't believe me, and they didn't want to go through the trouble of cleaning it out. My grandmother was very Catholic, and the thought of anything supernatural was utterly nonsense to her. As I was playing with my army men, I heard a deep growl from the utility room. It was so loud, it felt like it shook the ground, and I swear I even saw my army men vibrate a little. The worst part was the only way to get upstairs was either by running up the stairs, which meant I had to run right past the utility room door, or go out the back door and around the house in the middle of the night, and I didn't have a key. I chose the stairs and ran right past the utility room door, upstairs, and everyone was sleeping. I went into my mom's room and slept on the floor by her bed. The following morning, she got up and woke me up and asked me why I was sleeping on her floor. I told her what happened, and she laughed at me. At breakfast, I told my grandmother, and she also laughed at me. She told me it was just the furnace, 
I didn't even bother pointing out the obvious. It was the middle of summer and we weren't using the furnace. I tried telling them both that I had lived there for most of my life and I knew what the damn furnace sounded like anyway. They couldn't imagine that what I was telling them could be true or real. I couldn't go in my bedroom without feeling like I was being watched. Every time I walked up the stairs, I felt like someone was right behind me breathing on my neck. I would catch glimpses of it every time I was downstairs. Sometimes out of the corner of my eye, sometimes a shadow walking back and forth in front of the door, and worst of all, at night or when the lights were off downstairs, I would see it directly. It was way darker than dark, blacker than black, glaring at me. I never could clearly see its face, but I could feel it staring at me. It was so tall, it looked like its head was touching the ceiling. It was even plaguing my dreams, no matter if I slept upstairs or not. Every child thinks they would scream for their parents if they saw a monster, but it doesn't work that way. When you're actually face to face with something like this, and you feel cornered and trapped and can't get away, screaming isn't an option. You will be frozen with fear, completely unable to move. The only time I wasn't frozen was when I had a way to get out from it. When it was standing over my bed at night and I knew it was between me and the door, I couldn't function at all. The most I could do was pull the covers over my head and pray. I would eventually gain the courage to take a peek, and if it was gone, I would run to my mom's room as fast as possible. After so many weeks of waking her up every night and finding me on the floor, she finally decided to switch rooms with me. The first night, everything was fine. The next morning, I asked her how it was, and she laughed. The second night, maybe two or three o'clock in the morning, I got woken up by her climbing in bed beside me. I asked her what was going on, and her exact words were, You were right. There's something down there. I'm going to clean out the other room up here. I'm never sleeping down there again. My grandmother's room was right above my old bedroom, which was made into the new storage room after we cleaned out the other bedroom upstairs. One night, it was just me and her in the house. My mom went out for the night. I went to bed, and at some point later in the night, I got woken up by my grandmother. She was standing over the bed with a big-ass butcher knife. I thought she was going to try and kill me at first, but she said, Josh, Josh, get up. I need your help. Someone broke in. I could hear them moving around in your old bedroom. I told her to call the police, but she told me they wouldn't get there fast enough. She led me to the kitchen and handed me a knife as well, and told me to follow her to the basement. I stayed behind her the whole way, because I didn't know what we were going to find. We crept down the stairs as quietly as possible, and made our way through the first bedroom. We got to the door of my old room, and she yelled through the door, We know you're in there. Leave now. There's two of us, and we're both armed. She threw the door open and flipped on the light. We looked around the room and nothing had been disturbed. Everything was as it should have been. She had a very confused look on her face. She looked at me and said, I know I heard something. I know I'm not going crazy. Please don't tell your mom about this. I don't know what she'll think. I knew what she had heard, but I didn't even bother telling her what I thought she heard. She wouldn't believe me anyway. I know people will probably think that the things I saw were caused by sleep paralysis or night terrors. I would see it during the day before ever going to bed. One time a whole group of us saw it in the middle of the day, and it wasn't in my house. It was in the woods behind my house. It was the same group of kids that used to Ouija board with me. They were people I hung out with every day. There was a creek behind the house, and on the other side is a small patch of woods. We were playing in the woods by the creek. I don't know what prompted me to say it, but I said, What would you guys do if there was a monster in the woods? Right after saying that, my friend said, What's that guy doing? At the top of the hill, 
there was what first appeared to be a man walking a dog. He was pacing back and forth between two trees that were about ten feet apart. We were looking uphill at it, and the sun was in our eyes, so we all walked closer to get a better look. When we got close enough, we could see that it wasn't a man walking a dog. It was a three-dimensional walking shadow. It had four legs, but a human-looking torso. When it knew we all could clearly see it, the thing stopped and turned towards us. As usual, I couldn't see its face, but I could feel it glaring at me. It had ears that stuck out the side of its head like cat ears. It turned towards us and charged right at us. We ran like our lives depended on it. We ran straight through the creek, and I didn't even look back to see if my friends were still with me. We ran straight to my house and in through the back door. My brother was there, and he was about to walk out the back door right as we barreled through it together. We nearly took him off his feet. He still remembers us running in and freaking out, telling him we got chased by something in the woods. That thing was invited by us because of that damn Ouija board. It messed with me for years. I was its chosen target, its vessel. I eventually took my power back and told it I was done allowing it to scare me. I got rid of it, and when I was a teenager, I moved back into my old room. I used to have dreams where I would be in my old bedroom. The lights would be shut off, and I would run to the door, but it would slam shut when I got there. I would grab the doorknob, and it wouldn't open. I would try to flip on the light switch, and it wouldn't work. In my panic, I could hear it behind me laughing at me. I would be too scared to turn around. The last time I had that dream, after I tried the light switch, I turned around and I started yelling at it. I told it I wasn't scared of it anymore, and it had no power over me. I was 10 or 11 when everything started, and I was 16 or 17 when I got to that point, so I was terrorized by it for the first five years, if not six or seven years before. I finally had enough and refused to let it scare me anymore. I know that was long. I appreciate anyone who takes the time to listen to it, whether you believe it or not. I have written about this a lot. Some of my answers I have written about other experiences as well, and even gotten detail about a situation involving my grandmother. Ouija is not a toy. No child should ever, ever have one and any parent who thinks it's harmless fun has no idea what they're talking about. If it's put into the hands of someone who is already more open to things of that nature, especially a child who is, they can end up with a negative attachment that they did not ask for and aren't prepared for and don't know how to get rid of it. I personally think it's hard to believe Hasbro doesn't know what they're selling. Is not a toy at all. To me, it seems like they know exactly what they're doing, and they are intentionally marketing them to children as toys, knowing that children are more open to these types of things than anyone else isn't. We develop the skills to filter out things as we age. Children don't have a way to filter them out yet. I'm sure there's probably a safe way to use them, but they don't tell you how to use them safely in their instructions. They don't tell you that you can potentially invite evil into your home and life just by using them. They don't tell you what to do if that happens. There's so much they don't tell you when you buy one. The only thing they tell you is it's just a game, even though it's not. They lead you to believe it's harmless fun, even though it's not. They don't tell you that certain people using them in certain locations could potentially be a recipe for disaster. I do hope everyone who listens to this believes it. It's 100% true, but I already know they won't. But that doesn't stop me from telling it in hopes it will prevent someone from going through what I went through. Unfortunately, a lot of people won't listen. It's one of those fuck around and find out situations. My last answer about Ouija, I had someone try and tell me it's just a game, 
when I said that I told my teenagers if they ever bring one into my house, I'll burn it and they will be grounded for a month. They said, it's just a game. Let them have their fun. My response to that was, it's not just a game. It's not fun and you haven't lived my life. I find it sad that anyone thinks that way when they have no idea what they're talking about. This is one subject I take extremely seriously. I used a Ouija board once with my two younger brothers, 11, 13, and 15. We had heard around school about them, so naturally we were curious. A girl that went to our school, we didn't know her very well, had passed away, so we thought we would try to communicate to her. I recall the experience quite well, still to this day, as I'm now 40. We started asking for her specifically, calling out her name loud and clear. Nothing happened for a while, but we kept at it. Finally, the piece started to move to yes, and I remember we got so excited. I could tell from my brother's reactions that this was genuine and none of us were moving the piece. I remember how it seemed to float across the board so easily. We asked what their name was, and it spelt out her exact name. Here's some backstory. When I originally heard of her passing, I started to learn more about her just from everybody talking about her. She apparently had a phrase she used to always say, and I happened to recall that phrase that day and thought, why not ask if this spirit knew? So I asked the question, and the piece started to spell out her six-word phrase perfectly. I am just shocked. How is this possible? My brothers didn't know her phrase, so they couldn't spell it out if they wanted to. As we got into it more, she started pulling back and her responses started getting broken and short. We then didn't get any more responses from her at all, and the piece sat still for a while. We took a break for a bit, but then came back to it as it was such an adrenaline rush. We started playing again and connected with a different person or spirit. Didn't get a name. We started asking silly questions about girlfriends and grades, etc. Then, for some reason, I decided to up the ante and ask, Will I live past 20? Not sure why I asked that question, but I did. The piece, without hesitation, then moved towards no. I freaked out and ran upstairs to tell my parents. They calmed me down and told me everything would be okay and that we should stop playing with that silly board. So we did, and I haven't touched one to this day. Five years passed by. I hit 20 years old, so I'm in the clear. Side note to that, my parents told me years later that when I reached 20, they were quite relieved. Apparently, they had experiences with Ouija boards back when they were younger. They were a bit unsettled when I told them about the spirit board telling me my future. One year after that, so a total of six years now have passed since we played, my brother was killed in a car accident at the age of 18. And thinking back about it, all three of us had a finger on the piece so perhaps energy lines were crossed and the message was meant for him. Obviously, it could also just be a coincidence, but after the girl's spirit spelt out her signature phrase, it was very hard for me to deny what was going on. Are our paths laid out before we arrive? Can these spirits tap into those paths and predict outcomes? As I'm writing this, I'm recalling other strange events that occurred after my brother's death. This is a true story, 100%. A few months after my brother died, I was out with a buddy at a bar in a city I had never ever been to. We had met some new people at the bar and were sitting in these booths down in the lower level. I wasn't drinking, so completely sober, and I overheard a conversation next to me between two guys. The one guy laughs out loud, and 
has this look of astonishment on his face. He then looks over at me and says to the guy he's talking to, Now do him. I have no clue what's going on. Just met these people. The guy turns around and faces me. He then says, I know this will sound weird, but can I hold your watch and bracelet? I laughed. He laughs. There's an awkward pause. Then, more pausing. He nods. I say, okay then. Here you go. He then holds them in his hand and looks down towards the ground with his eyes closed. About five seconds pass. He looks up at me, and his expression has changed. He says, Oh, I am so sorry. You just lost your brother. My jaw is on the floor. Eyes start to well up. What just happened? He didn't get that info from my friend, and he didn't know me. This shit was crazy. Anyhow, to circle back, I don't blame the Ouija board for what I said, nor do I believe I started a curse or anything of that nature. I've heard other predictions from people over the years, after my brother's passing, that have come true. One person in particular stood out that worked with the local police in locating missing people. As well, I've heard about spirit guides and their role of delivering information to people on our side. Perhaps that's what a Ouija board is, a spirit guide, and it's just a conduit to deliver information. From all that I have heard, the predictions felt like someone was reading from a script, like they could read something that I could not. Some were better at reading the script than others, as I found out while events unfolded. Some predictions were repeated at different times by different people. That to me is very interesting. How can one person tell me a very, very specific statement and then I hear the exact same statement from a different person a year later. In my opinion, there is something going on out there that's just on a different level of connectivity. If that's true, I'm definitely haunting my kids. Well, to keep it short and sweet, since I've already shared my story, I was playing with a girl and the child that she aborted talked to her, asking her why, saying he was her son. I would never, ever get an abortion after that. I didn't even know she had one, and after, she was bawling her eyes out. So I know it wasn't a trick. But since this is about Ouija boards, I always like to post the rules to make sure you stay safe. These things are dangerous. If you do not know what you're doing, the Ouija board can be dangerous. There are rules that you must follow. There are evil spirits that can harm you if you invite them into your realm. You must always be careful with things that you don't fully understand. The main guidelines you want to stick to are do not leave the planchette on the board unattended. And I do mean ever. If the planchette is on the board, make sure someone is holding it at all times. Always say goodbye at the end of a session. Make sure the planchette goes to goodbye as well. If you do not, it's like setting a phone down without hanging up. The person can linger on the other line, listening to you. Never invite an entity to make a noise, to show its presence, or to invite it near you, ever. You do not know what it is and what its intentions are, so please do not ever ask them to show themselves. Don't let the planchette go from A to Z or 1 to 0, either forwards or backwards, because this is an incantation for a spirit to get into the human realm. If this happens, stop the planchette and say goodbye until it moves to goodbye. Don't ever play it in a cemetery. That is just asking for trouble. The dead do not want to be disturbed. If someone goes to your house while you're resting and continuously calls you outside the door, I'm sure you wouldn't be very happy either. Don't ever let the planchette make a figure eight circle repeatedly. This is also an incantation to pass into the human realm. 
Stop the plan chat immediately and end the conversation. Always play with respect. Imagine a Ouija board as an online chat room where you post your telephone number and wait for someone to call you. You have no idea who is on the other line. Respect whomever you're talking to or don't play. You could be asking for consequences. And lastly, here are some tips that I advise you are. Start a conversation by asking if there is anyone who would like to speak with you. Patience is key, just like a slow internet connection. It may take a few minutes to get a response. Don't bombard the board with questions. Ask something and wait a few minutes. If you don't get a response after a few minutes, try asking again. You may be having difficulty getting the answer you seek because of the way you're wording your question. Try changing it up a little and you may be able to get a better response. The way you word things is extremely important. Yes or no questions are usually the easiest for a spirit to answer. It's helpful to have paper and a writing utensil around to write down the session, especially if they are spelling out a word for you. Just make sure that you or another player has a hand on the planchette at all times during a session. If you're worried about talking to a good spirit and to avoid evil ones, you may very well ask them if they come from the light or simply by asking them, are they good spirits? But be careful. Sometimes demons will lie, though. Most will be honest and have no shame in telling you that they are a demon. However, it won't ever hurt you to be cautious. Please don't use the Ouija board if you do not take it seriously. You can put you and others in danger. It is not a game. It is an oracle. It even says it on the board. Enjoy your time, but please stay safe out there. Hello everyone, I hope you're ready. This is a wild one. To start, I'm pretty well versed in the supernatural at this point, from a technical and personal standpoint. I know how to protect myself and everything. My favorite time, yet definitely the scariest, using the Ouija board was actually my most recent. It was a few weeks ago at a friend's party. What started out as the most interesting and in-depth relationship with any spirit so far ended up scaring the few of us that were still there. It wasn't my board this time, but a commercial one, the kind sold as a board game. It was a lot bigger than mine, which was good since more people were playing. We had gone through a couple sessions already, meeting a 14-year-old boy who had drowned and someone who said 69 and then left, giving us a hearty laugh, and possibly a demon who we immediately closed contact with and cleansed the room. One more time, my friend Maria said. We started the game in Spanish like we had been, since we figured people who had died here in Mexico could speak Spanish. But this time, the answers didn't make a lot of sense. Would you prefer we speak in English? Maria asked. Yes, the spirit replied. So we started from the top, me asking the questions. He was a man, 41 years of age, who died in 1952. He only gave his name as D, but made it clear that was not his real name. He had died from, in his words, G-U-N, in Maria's building but luckily not her floor. He was a Canadian, but had lived in Mexico during his life. What brought you down here? I ask. W-O-R-K. What job? S. I bet he was a spy, my friend Andrea interrupted. E. Or a secretary? X. We all sat in silence a second. Oh boy, were you a pimp? My friend Loreo asked. Yes. Wow, here we are talking to a dead Canadian pimp from the 50s. My friends asked him 
all sorts of questions about if he thought he was wrong in that or whatever. He basically said that women were goats. Ouch. Loraru, being the good guy, started lecturing D on how coercing young women into sex work isn't moral and all that. This was the funniest part, though. Without prompting, the planchette began moving again, very, very, very quickly, from S to H to U. S-H-U-T-U-P. That's right, folks. A ghost told my friend to shut up. I quickly punched Larey with my free hand. Yeah, Larey, you shut up. Andrea asked Dee if he liked Loreu. No. Sophia, a sweet girl who had been afraid, asked if he liked her. Yes. She was touched until we reminded her that Dee was a middle-aged pimp. We asked if Dee had been killed because of his job. Yes. If it was lonely in the afterlife. No. If he had any friends there. No. If he had enemies there. Yes. If the person who killed him was there with him. Yes. Bummer. But it was time for cake, so we bid him farewell. A few hours later, most of the guests had gone. It was just me, Maria, and our pal, Farrell. We decided to play a couple more rounds before Farrell and I had to leave. When we got another yes from the inventational question, we asked the spirit's name, as usual, D. Is this the same D we spoke to earlier? Farrell asked. Yes. Nice to see you again, I said. We talked to him for a while longer. His favorite color was purple. I asked him where he grew up. I-D-O-N-T-K-N-O. W. You don't know where you grew up? Maria asked. Yes. Did you forget? Yes. Do you remember your parents? I asked. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it hard to remember things in the afterlife? Yes. What do you remember? W I F E. The three of us collectively awed at that. What was her name? I D O N. You don't remember? Interrupted Maria. Yes. Sad, right? What do you remember about her? H A I R. He had two kids, a boy and a girl, the daughter older. He didn't remember their names either, but this is where it got a little scary for us. We had talked for a while now, and it was late. We had exhausted most topics. Maria decided to ask, Is there anything you wanted to talk about? L-I-F-E Wow. Do you want us to help you remember your life? I asked. Yes. How do you want me to do that? Maria asked. O-U-T we stopped, looking at each other. You never, never let a spirit out, no matter what. I'm sorry, D. I I said. We can't do that. Yes, he answered. No, Maria backed me up. We can't let you out. I'm sorry. N-O-W, came the reply. Yeah, no. We were done at this point, shaken up. We're going to say goodbye now, D. but it's been really good to meet you. The planchette nearly flew over to know. Yes, Beryl said. We're going now. Goodbye. We manually moved the planchette through goodbye, seeing as D probably wouldn't have helped us with it. Shaking, we ended the session and lit white candles to cleanse the room. It was freaking freaky but by far the most interesting experience I've ever had. I played with Ouija in my youth. It 
is not safe. You will be accessing a familiar spirit, a demon who knows things, who can impress you with his knowledge. When we ask it, the Ouija demon did rebuild to myself and my fellow player the unusual first name of a teacher in high school who kept her name a secret from everyone. Even the school records did not have it. The next day, when I told the teacher the name that Ouija had told us, she immediately asked how we had learned this. When I told her it was the Ouija board, her eyes widened, she turned white, and quickly walked away. I was spiritually naive in those days, but had a creepy feeling about it. Spirits, demons, use every opportunity they can find. Demonic beings had their way with me for several years until I cried out to God to take me out of the kingdom of Satan and put me in his kingdom. After receiving Christ as my savior at age 36 and denouncing my entertaining of several other spirits, I had picked up over the years by opening myself up to them. After receiving Jesus as Lord, I was literally under attack from demons for over a year, but able to get them out of my presence by commanding them to leave in the name of Jesus. In his name, he is a tremendous power given to the Christian. So I never feared them, but did find them a real nuisance. I'm glad that the demons had not killed me as they did some others, including my ex-boyfriend, but they ruined my life until I found Christ. I do not recommend Ouija to anyone. Don't be deceived as I was that it is only a fun game. It is a dangerous game. Just as is your first time using heroin, it does not stop. I was about seven years old, my brother about 10. It was well past our bedtime when our mom woke up off the couch to put us to bed. Our dad worked construction out of town back then, so it was often just us three at the house for weeks at a time. Up the stairs and to the immediate right was our parents' bedroom. Going left puts you in the middle of a hallway. Taking another left down that hallway led to my brother's room. The opposite end was my room, which was also across the hall from our upstairs bathroom. At either end of the hallway are windowed doors we always kept locked and rarely used. The door on my end led to a balcony overlooking our backyard, and the door on my brother's end opened to our back porch. The house kind of leaned into a small hill. My brother and mom both had a habit of waking up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I only knew this because I was always a light sleeper, and they just couldn't help flushing with the door wide open. This night, however... My brother stopped on his way to his room and came back towards the bathroom. I'm going to try to pee before I go to bed. The past few nights, I've been afraid to walk in the bathroom. I keep seeing a man wearing stripes at the end of the hallway. I don't know if my mom wrote it off as my brother telling ghost stories to try to scare me or if she was already half asleep and didn't catch it but she didn't react at all to my brother's confession. I, on the other hand, was terrified by it. The fear of seeing a ghost like that at the end of the hallway or through the windows is the reason I started running from the stairs to my bedroom at night. Years later, when I was about 18, my mom and I were having a conversation in her car about a dog we had for a very short time when I was little. We were sharing stories about Max's tendency towards destroying my shoes and other unruly behaviors when my mom blurted out, Do you remember that time I opened the front door for the cops and Max ran inside to the kitchen and started tearing open that big bag of dog food we had? This really caught me by surprise because in all the years I've lived in that house, we never once called the cops. 
gun owner family in a quiet rural West Virginia neighborhood, etc. I asked her what she was talking about, and she looked really surprised, as if she had just revealed something by accident. Oh, <laughs> that's right, I never told you because you were too young at that point in time. Anyway, one night I woke up hearing noises outside my window, and when I looked, I saw a man staring into my bedroom. She went on to describe how turning on the lights caused him to take off running, and how she grabbed my dad's pistol before calling the cops. I can't remember all the details I gave them when they showed up. Tall, white male wearing a striped shirt and jeans, short, dark hair, something like that. They said it matched the description of a man they were looking for in the area. It turns out he had escaped from jail on a murder charge. Now, I know it sounds so obvious hearing those two stories back to back, but it wasn't until a few years ago in my mid-twenties that I pieced together that my brother had unknowingly warned us about a murderer who spent multiple nights casing our home. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Ouija stories. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Chrissy Elias, Sugar Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita B, Doba Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support. For without you, there wouldn't be a me or the Back to Ashes channel. If you are sleeping by now, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourselves a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.